Hello, hello. Thank you for joining me. This is my third day sharing vocal readings and synthesis of the focus topics from book 30 in my A Book A Week series, Alan Watts, Out of Your Mind. Today I want to talk a little bit about spirituality and the game of one-upmanship. Many of the most enlightened and Zen individuals in my life are not people who read about spirituality or study expanded consciousness or um, people who would identify with uh, being Zen or enlightened in the least. And I think that um, I mention this because it's, uh, for me, been a remarkable um, observation. I noticed that, <clears throat> I'll speak personally here, that I study expanded consciousness and enlightenment because I need to. <laughs> and I notice that that is often, not always, not always, but often the case. And in my um, working with this curriculum, I have maneuvered into community uh, interaction with groups who are focused on this curriculum many times. And each time that I have, what I notice is um, a sensation that we are all connecting to an interest in appearing to be enlightened. Um, that that it, it almost becomes the center of uh, what is happening in the group interaction. And I noticed this undercurrent under um, what individuals are saying and sharing, including myself, of, um, of examination and filtering such that each of us may appear to be what we are there to achieve. And um, I have, every time I've noticed this, been keenly interested in that activity. Um, I, I find it to be a, a unique environment in which to examine human behavior, including my own. I bring this up today because um, I do think that many of us have this idea in our minds of the enlightened one or the Buddha and um, that we may be misperceiving how that person may behave in their human form day to day. We may expect that they don't, um, they somehow have transcended human experience, that they've specifically um, found a way to rise above feeling what we mere mortals feel, um, like frustration, anger, sadness, what I find to be characteristic of enlightenment is not the transcendence out of all of these human experiences that we may mark as negative, that we surely have marked as negative, um, rather uh, what I envision as um, one foot in the path of human patterning and interaction with everything that happens on the screen of experience and a playfulness <laughs> about that um, in and with, not despite the uh, sensations that we have marked as negative in the human experience and one foot in um, the under 
understanding beyond or underneath or just behind the experience that is emerging on the screen, um, which uh, sees the broad perspective, which even when the human form is not able to gain perspective, what, uh, what that part of the enlightenment does for us is that it roots us in a, a memory of perspective, even when we can't gain it yet. It roots us, we could call it faith, roots us in the, the, um, the supportive serenity of having once experienced whole serenity, even if we can't connect with it vividly in that moment. I have this imagery of one foot in one experience and the other foot in the other. And of course, uh, uh, using both feet to walk and flow through life. Um, and many may uh, envision the razor's edge of Zen or a tightrope walk, which is something that I often reference. Um, in the balance that's involved with having one foot in the playful, full commitment to an interaction with human form and one foot in that remembering that offers a, a calm, cool equanimity amidst <laughs> all of the volatility that is inevitable in the human condition. I want to circle this around to uh, the focus topic that I'm speaking on today, spirituality and the game of one-upmanship. I find um, that the people who are the most enlightened, who are expressing that, are coming across as, um, as having this calm, steady understanding that no one is more important than another one and that no event is more important than another event. And this understanding comes across not through an expression that this is so, but through a contentedness that is steady. <laughs> what I notice um, about my interest in interacting in spiritual um, communities versus or contrasted with interacting with um, communities or individuals who do not um, identify as spiritual or who are not focused on spiritual curriculum is um, that I am just as enriched by one as <laughs> by the other. I, I do find um, that I enjoy my studies to be in silence and I enjoy uh, the capacity to, um, to sink in to the pulses or the rhythms that emerge for me with as much spontaneity as, um, as might be indulgent to me at the moment. And I enjoy doing that in, in quiet, in my home. Um, and what I enjoy about studying uh, with a collective is a, a completely, has a completely different quality. What I enjoy there is that we're focusing on, um, we're focusing on a topic together, and there is so much enrichment to be had in learning from each other's minds in that space. And I enjoy noticing uh, what is emerging for each of us and what might be underneath um, or motivating the way that each of us is interacting with one another. What I notice in those group settings is how much we are all 
hoping to come across with purity. And, um, and I think that that in itself is such a rich contemplation. I noticed that for myself and I've noticed in others, um, a little bit of a, a rascality or a rebellious um, impulse to, um, to trigger <laughs> a, a more playful spirit, a more spontaneous spirit. Um, and even in that, I notice my trying. <laughs> uh, and that is mm, just as rich as uh, the capacity that I have in my home alone to uh, flow into the different pulses that emerge potentially without as much motivation to appear a certain way to myself. What I want to say in concluding today is that um, I noticed that uh, so much <clears throat> expanded consciousness and so much um, of the Zen flow is something that uh, I see emerging not within a human form but um, through human forms and between human forms and um, as as I move in this curriculum I notice more and more that I don't connect to an expectation about when and where I might feel <laughs> the spark of uh, the eternal. It uh, is just as often, I'm tempted to say more often, um, likely to emerge in a, su a surprising place. Uh, and <laughs> I would quite recommend uh, the opening <laughs> towards seeing that. It's, it's a delight. I'm going to thread this into my first vocal reading for the day. I'm on page 107. A Zen student is a person who has stopped playing the status game. The real meaning of being a monk is no longer trying to keep up with the Joneses. To become a master, he or she must get to the point where they're not trying to become a master. The whole idea of being better than someone else doesn't make sense at all. It's totally meaningless. <laughs> Without further ado, I'll move on to our today's readings. Enjoy. Page 77. We commonly think that children, particularly babies, are inferior in view to adults. If an adult showed signs of a baby's undifferentiated, non-selective awareness, a psychologist would call this regression. In actuality, we need the baby's view as the basis for the adult view, because if we don't have that basis, we take the adult view, selective awareness, far too seriously. We get completely carried away. It's like someone playing poker and losing their nerve because they've forgotten that it's only a game. So he or she becomes a very bad player in life. We're all playing a game, but we've forgotten that because we've lost the infant's way of seeing. But what we actually need is both ways of seeing. That's a Buddha's view. We know both, so we aren't taken in by adult games, although we're perfectly capable of playing them. It's just that we don't take them too seriously. Page 79. If we can see that the ego is purely fictitious, that it is merely an image of ourselves coupled with a sensation of muscular strain occasioned by trying to make this image an effective agent to control emotion and direct the nervous operations of our organism, then it becomes clear that what we have called ourselves isn't able to do anything at all if we realize that. A kind of silence follows in which there's nothing to do except watch what happens. 
But what is happening is watching itself. There's nobody apart from it watching it. Page 86. We've hoodwinked ourselves by attributing powerlessness to nothingness. But just as you can't know form without the background, you can't know something, life, without nothing. You've heard the saying, when you're dead, you're dead. The people who came up with that saying are the people who want to rule the world. They want to frighten you with the idea that death is final, that believing anything else is wishful thinking. They'll tell you to face the facts. What facts? How can I face the fact of nothing, which by definition is not a fact? People who argue that the basic reality of all this is nothingness, physicists who think that the energy of the universe is gradually running down and dissipating, for example, ignore the fact that all of this comes from nothingness. Page 97. To be pure-minded in Zen, or rather clear-minded is a better way of translating it, means that your mind isn't sticky. You just go with the flow of life. You don't harbor grievances or remain stuck to the past. Life is flowing all the time. That's the Tao. And you're going to go along with the flow whether you want to or not. We're like people in a stream, and we can swim against the stream if we want, but all we'll do is wear ourselves out while the stream moves us along anyway. However, when we swim with the stream, the whole strength of the flow is ours. Of course, the difficulty that many of us have is finding out which way the stream is going. Page 98. You discover you are the whole universe, and you discover it suddenly which is a shock. Your common sense is turned directly inside out. Everything is the same as it was before, only completely different. <laughs> because you now know who you are. And what the devil were you worrying about before? What was all that fuss and to do about? Well, you see, it was part of the game. From one point of view, it's all fuss and to do, to do, to do. But when you wake up, you discover that the to-do wasn't you. It was the entire works, the it. And you are it. And it is it. And everything is it. <laughs> and it does all things that are done. When a thief robs a house and the cops get called, they enter the house on the ground floor while the thief climbs the stairs to the next floor up. And when the police go up to that floor, the thief climbs up to the next. In the same way, when we feel ourselves to be the lower self, that is, a separate ego, the moralists come along and say, don't be selfish. So the ego tries to pretend it's good by identifying with a higher self. If you think you have a lower self or an ego to get rid of, and you fight against it, nothing strengthens the delusion that it exists more than that. So this tremendous schizophrenia in humans of thinking they are rider and horse, soul and command of body, a will that must control passions and so on, this kind of split thinking simply aggravates the problem. Page 102. But you also can't overcome being stuck if you think that somehow you would be guilty if you were stuck. When you are perfectly free to feel stuck or not stuck, then you're unstuck. <laughs> Nothing can stick to the real mind. You'll find this out yourself if you watch the flow of your thoughts.